Welcome to the Fighting on Film podcast, the podcast all about classic and obscure war movies, from the Normandy landings to the days of chivalry and swords. If it's been captured on film, we're going to try and cover it. I'm Robbie of RM Military History. I'm Matthew Moss of Historical Firearms and the Armourer's Bench. Hello, welcome back to Fighting on Film, the war movie podcast. Today, we bring you a sound design special. We're joined by Emmy award-winning sound designer, Charles Maines. He has over 180 credits to his name and has worked on some war movies that include Letters from Iwo Jima, Flags from Our Fathers, The Alamo, U571, and the Pacific miniseries, to name but a few. Charles, we're delighted to have you here. Thank you, thank you. So Charles, I suppose the best place for us to start would be how did you get started in sound design and how has it changed over the years? As far as how I got into sound design, um, basically it was through uh, working in music. Um, I'm a musician and the, um, I guess in the early 80s, uh, the technology changed to such a degree that um, we started seeing what was called digital sampling, which was where mm-hmm. sounds, musical sounds in most cases back then could be recorded digitally and then placed in a, in a keyboard instrument where you could play them in different pitches. You know, usually if you had a piano recording, you could, you know, do a kind of a fake piano if you like. Yeah. yeah. Um, this technology basically found great usefulness in the film and te- television industry where people could essentially put sound effects in place of musical sounds so that they could trigger them on demand when, you know, essentially uh, locking their, their video or picture to some sort of computer system which would allow them to compose uh, like a sound effects composition, if you will. Right. Um, so, you know, again, you know, my, my start came from the music side. Um, I ended up working in the musical, in- musical instrument industry doing specific recordings for these instruments and working on like synthesizers, which kind of were similar to them. So you were capturing the, the sounds of instruments to put into synthesizers that sort of thing right and then also you know doing all of the editorial work so you know i mean Mm. like you know back then you know synthesizers would have a very 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 small amount of memory that they could store these sounds in so we would have to do all sorts of editing that would allow them to seem natural you know by looping and things like that but you know they just you know didn't have very much space to do it i mean compared to now you know it's like you know as you know the computer industry is one of you know virtually unlimited storage so those kind of issues don't factor at all nowadays. Basically, how I ended up moving from that universe into, um, you know, doing sound for film and, and television and games and stuff um, was that I migrated work-wise into, um, you know, moving from musical instruments to a company that was doing digital systems that recorded music, like in replacing a, t- a tape recorder or something. Right. Um, this was called Digital Design at the time, and um, they essentially created a, a multi-track system that could be used for post-production sound. So you know you could essentially do the same sort of compositions you would do with those keyboard instruments, but you wouldn't have the limitations of storage because all the sounds were on hard disk, and you could you know sequence them to match your image that was going past. So if you know you had a scene where somebody shot a gun. You could essentially have a time code address for that gunshot. You could then move a sound in the in a computer timeline to that moment in time, and have it repl- you know be able to be replayed on demand. Right. So you know th- this was a, a a gigantic transformational milestone for the industry. Oh yeah, I can imagine. I mean, prior to that, you know, basically, you know, all sound for film had been cut on film you know, like literal 35 millimeter film or 16 millimeter film in low budget cases where, you know, literally they would, you know, put, you know, huge amounts of of leader space in between each particular sound effect that had to play at a particular moment in an image sequence. And you would have, you know, potentially thousands of tracks of, of these things that, you know, people would essentially mix together. Um, You know, and it was, you know, basically the, the standard paradigm for operation up until about, Probably 19, uh, I'd say ni- around 1990, you know, that right. was that was kind of the dominant method for creating sound for film was using, you know, discrete physical mag tracks. 
um, around that time, you know, the industry did transition through, you know, uh, companies like the Synclavier company, which made a big workstation that was very expensive, and the Fairlight, which you may or may not have heard of. But um, they were workstations that basically allowed for multi-track digital performances to happen. Um, and then, like I said, the company that I ended up working for created a system called Pro Tools, which was, it has become essentially the de facto standard worldwide. Yeah, so, even I've heard of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, same. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it's very, very pervasive. In, in, like I said, worldwide in the film industry. They've, they've essentially, Avid, the, the company, Digital Design, that company got purchased by Avid, which does the picture side of things. And they've essentially created an entire ecosystem for finishing films. So it's like, you know, everything from the picture sequences to, you know, picture storage to the sound side of it to the mixing and, the, um, you know, mixing consoles is all within their universe now. So it's like they've, they've really actually gotten a, an effective monopoly on the whole process. Wow. So, so what was the first war film that you worked on? Technically speaking, that would probably be Starship Troopers. We um, count it. We would count it as a war film here. <laughs> yes, yes. And that was, I mean, the thing that was interesting was, you know, basically, actually, in my, in my, in my path to getting into this, I have to say that um, the one probably the most significant singular influence for me wanting to do sound for film was seeing Terminator 2. Um, you know, I thought it was the most spectacular film ever. Yeah. Um, I thought, you know, the, all of the, the, the gunplay and everything was amazing sounding, which I, I actually still entirely believe now. I still believe it's one of the best films yeah. for that sort of yeah, thing really I've ever up, seen. Yeah, 100%. It, you wouldn't know it's made in 1990 something you know you know when i saw that it was like i really i think that would be a really cool thing to do you know seeing that and then you know basically getting into the industry in 1996 uh, i moved from the san francisco bay area where i worked at that company to you know essentially transplanting to los angeles where i was hired by universal pictures as you know a, essentially an entire novice but i had the digital knowledge for them so it's like i was kind of expected to be almost a support person as well as a learning the editorial side. And, you know, essentially that was my gateway into to, to Hollywood. Um, you know, I transitioned to another company called Creative Cafe, uh, who was owned by Stephen Flick, who's uh, Oscar win actually multiple Oscar winning sound designer, sound editor, um, who was just, you know, an amazing influence on, on my work and certainly, you know, was very instrumental in me being able to get the opportunities to work on things that were really interesting and creative and, you know, expansive of my experience pool. Yeah. So with Steven, we did Starship Troopers. Um, that was the first movie that I had ever recorded guns for. Uh, as you know, there's a few gunshots in it. Um, yeah, yeah, there's a couple. Yeah. <laughs> there, 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 <laughs> just, a just a few. Just a few. <laughs> and it, in, in my crazy, you know, exuberance, uh, when I was when I was working with Steven, I, I, I volunteered to do all the guns for the movie. And, you know, this is somebody who, you know, literally has like three years or two years at the time, I think, experience doing this at all. You know, it was obviously a, a huge part of the project to, 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 to bite off. But it, it was a, a fantastic learning experience. You know, I mean, it really kind of, you know, taught me tons. Uh, we have re-recording mixers. They are the ones who kind of provide the final balances of what you hear on the screen, uh, whether it's on TV or the cinema. And, you know, working with the, uh, Kevin O'Connell and Greg Russell, who were the mixers on that show, honestly learned, you know, almost, I won't say everything, you know, I needed to know, but I certainly learned enough to essentially be able to do those kind of sounds for, you know, large scale pictures. Yeah. Um, they had a they had a, a large background in doing like the Jerry Bruckheimer films and stuff. So you know they'd done things like The Rock and Top Gun and Pirates of the Caribbean. Mm. Um, so you know it, again it's it's one of those things where it's like I think it was you know talking about this earlier where you know you 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 just literally go day by day and you learn each day new things and you know after a number of years you go oh wow look I I, I think I actually have an idea of what I'm doing. That's, you know, basically kind of the, the nutshell of, you know, getting into the, the business and process. Wow. I was, I was going to ask, I suppose everyone's heard of Foley artists and that sort of thing. But I was wondering what in the last 20 years, what does the ecosystem of, of sound design and film look like? Is it sound recordists, sound designers, mixers? Is it that sort of 
structure to sound design when it comes to, to cinema? There's some contentiousness as, as to the, the, the overarching terms meanings. Um, oh, I can imagine. And, yeah. Mm. yeah. I mean, you know, like with a re-recording mixer, you know, it's like, that's a very obvious thing. It's like, you know, there isn't a lot of wiggle room as to, you know, if, if a person is sitting at the mixing desk, mixing the film for the final thing that he, he is a re-recording mixer period. Um, you know, in the, in the process we have, you know, basically, um, you know, in production sound, we have, you know, a sound mixer who is kind of like the boss on the set. And then he has, you know, utility people and boom operators who move the microphones to get the sounds that they need. Yeah. You know, once we hit post-production, uh, we have Foley artists and Foley recordists. So, you know, the artist is the one who's actually, you know, standing at the microphone, manipulating a particular thing or walking footsteps or, or you know, generally it's the, the things that you see on screen that, you know, are very specific in their nature that, you know, wouldn't necessarily be a sound effect, mm -hmm. you know, like where somebody had recorded a sound effect. Right. So does a sound designer have an input on what, say, a Foley artist captures? So if you need something, do you go to them and say, I need this sort of sound effect for this scene? Or is it something that's handled by someone else? Uh, well, Foley is a huge part of sound design. And we have some, you know, amazing Foley artists, at least, you know, I, I know in the UK, there's great ones, but you know, the ones I know here in, in the United States, um, you know, John Resch, you know, is, is a very, very famous Foley artist. Um, Dan O'Connell is a very famous Foley artist. Um, you know, I mean, they, they, they do the lion's share of, you know, the, the larger budget features. And, and below them, there's like a whole, you know, universe of, you know, people who just don't have that name recognition who do excellent work as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Same with any sort of industry, isn't it, really? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, the, the, generally speaking, you know, it's like once you are at a level of professional competence, the work is fine. It's really a matter of, you know, you getting noticed for a, 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 a particular film or TV show that, mm -hmm. that gets the attention of the public. But it's usually not due to the work itself being insanely extraordinary all on its own because that's kind of it, it, you're basically expected to do extraordinarily awesome work every time you go out <laughs> so, yeah, of course yeah. yeah so yeah i mean it's a it's kind of funny in that regard um as far as the sound design it, well then it, you're going from you know the foley side of things you know we get into um the post-production sound editorial which usually is headed up by a person called the supervising sound editor Right. Um, they are the ones who ultimately are the, the, the person in charge and they could be the sound designer on the show and functioning as a supervising sound editor. Um, but, you know, in some cases you have, you know, a supervising sound editor who is functioning in a more administrative role where they're, you know, essentially managing all of the plates yeah, spinning. Depending on the size of the production sort of thing. Exactly. And then, you know, you could have a separate sound designer who essentially would have you know, would be considered the creative master of the process. Right. Um, and then you have your sound editors and the sound editors are usually broken out into, you know, people who are doing dialogue editing, which is, you know, from the production audio uh, that's recorded at the time of filming. Um, we have, th we have a thing called ADR, which you probably yep. have heard, um, you know, which is essentially where um, actors will come in and, you know, record lines in the studio in order to insert, within the production sound either because production was not particularly good or there was an intention to change the story which actually has happened a lot you know mm. uh, through history um you know it's seen by some directors as, as a as a terrific you know device to be able to you know shape their storytelling when their their images and their production dialogue don't necessarily give them the kind of story flow that they were hoping for. Then you have your sound effects editors, which I do most of the time. Um, you know, we're, we're basically looking at it and, you know, essentially trying to put what I would call sounds that are dramatically supporting the image. So it's not a matter of making awesome. When we think of like sound design, you know, in most cases, you think of something like the Matrix or Star Wars, you know, where it's like yeah. it's clearly, you know, very fant you know, fantastical kind of, you know, sounds that obviously don't exist in real life. Um, you know, sound design, though, is, I think Randy Tom has, has an idea where, you know, he looks at the sound designer as being the oral equivalent of the director of photography. 
on a yeah, set. Yeah, that makes sense massively. You know, yeah. you know where you know it's like they're they're making the decisions as to how a scene is lit, because obviously the lighting can have a giant impact on the dramatic moment. Mm. Um, so as a sound designer, you know, we're oftentimes trying to provide that support. You know, where it's like you know giving a mood to the soundtrack. Mm. Um, and then on the other side, we're sometimes we're just making up really neat sounds. You know, it's like, yeah, we need, you know, John Wick's gun to sound really special. So, you know, we build a composite sound out of all sorts of things to make a unique sound for that particular instrument. Or it could be a car or, you know, any anything you want to want to consider. A sound editor, I, I worked with John Morris, who is a he's done a lot of international work. He, he always said that it was very interesting to him that. Um, you know, when he was working in France, that French directors would be very conscious of what's called a cloth track. And that's done in Foley. And basically it is, you know, the, the movement of literally the fabric of clothing. Wow. Okay. So it's that minute. So the, they would be very concerned with, you know, essentially that cloth track being, you know, representing the storytelling that they wanted. Right. Which I mean, you know, honestly, it's like when I heard that, I was actually kind of surprised. I mean, I was impressed, but I was surprised because it was considered to be just like, oh, yeah, you just you use it because you just need some noise sometime. You know, it's like, you know, we've got a gap. We need a, we need some kind of noise. So let's lift up the cloth, tra cloth track so we can hear it and then we'll get rid of it when we don't need it. But obviously, you know, there's filmmakers who take, you know, very, very big concern and, you know, they want to use all of those tools available to them for mm. the furthering of their storytelling, which I think is wonderful. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so we got to sound editors. Uh, I mean, the only other person that I can really think of that, um, you know, we haven't included is, you know, people who do sound effects recording for films. Yeah. So, you know, oftentimes like, um, on bigger, on bigger budget productions, you know, it's like, you know, the sound department will have the opportunity to have access to weapons or vehicles or other things that are used in the production so that we can essentially get a, a sound effects quality recording versus the production sound recording. Now, the one thing I should say is that like when you, when you see a film set and, you know, it's like, you, you know, you see a, a, like an action scene even played out, um, the production sound recordist and the, the person with the boom is for the most part, only interested in getting whatever dialogue is coming out of the actor's mouths. All the that other sounds sense, yeah. are, are entirely irrelevant and actually for the most part, kind of unwanted. Um, so it's like, you know, the sound from location is very rarely usable as far as a kind of totality of sound. Mm. Um, probably one of the biggest, uh, uh, um, exceptions to that rule was um it, uh, I mean, this is going to be something you probably even have talked about at one point or another um in the film heat the iconic downtown shootout after the bank robbery yeah um i did not work on that film but i've heard plenty of anecdotal stories from people who did i'm sure um, yeah. um mm -hmm. it's my understanding that basically michael mann specific w went into that scene thinking that i can replace all the dialogue I can replace all the other sounds. I just want the sound of the guns right. in that space. Reverberating through the, the, the exactly. buildings. Mm. Because that's something that would be impossible to really effectively recreate on a dubbing stage. Yeah. You know, and, and also, you know, it's like if you're trying to recreate that, even with an unlimited amount of time and, and, you know, resource, you would never have the confidence that that was really what it sounded like. Yeah. Mm. I suppose so. You know, so, you know, man actually filmed that, that sequence was set up and it was recorded for sound for the gunshots specifically. Yeah. You so, heard about you the know, amount of microphones that he had in that take. It's where he placed and things like that. It's just it's oh, yeah. mind boggling. Yeah. And I mean, and remember that was, you know, what, 1995 or so. Mm, you know, I mean, yeah. that was, that was an older film. When you think about, you know, the, the, the resources that were available as far as, you know, just the post-production process, they were significantly reduced from what we have today. I mean, we can literally run a thousand channels with like very little trouble, wow. you know, into a mix. And, and I can have, you know, a thousand channels here in my room that I can, I can use. Whereas, wow. I mean, when I started in, in Hollywood, 
I brought from DigiDesign, you know, the, the most advanced Pro Tools that I could get when I left the company as an employee. And I could play 16 simul simultaneous sounds, you know, mono sounds. And now I can play, I want to say it's 2084. That's, a, that's mad. On, my, on a little Mac Mini, you know, with wow. no other hardware. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's truly extraordinary, you know, the kind of, you know, Moore's Law leaps that we've seen in the technology itself. I think the next question I'd, I'd love to ask is, so, so how involved in the production do you get? You know, do you visit the set? How involved do you get? Well, it depends on the project. Um, I mean, with films, it's usually a little more difficult because usually the filming takes place ahead of when, you know, most post-production sound is involved with the film. Hmm. I, I work on a, a, a television series here in the United States called Seal Team. When I got hired, the producers were very insistent upon having somebody who really had a very solid understanding of all of the gear and weapons that were being used because they wanted it to be, they didn't want it to sound like a Hollywood thing. They wanted it to sound accurate. That was a, a, a huge deal for them. Mm. And, you know, I, I recorded loads and loads and loads of weapons for different films and video games and things like that. So, you know, it's like I have a reputation of, you know, a, a relatively deep background actually hearing these things in real life and, you know, working with them. So that was seen, you know, I was seen as a good choice for that. And they, they ended up selecting me as far as, you know, doing the sound editing. And I'm still working on the show. So, you know, we I've done 80 episodes. Um, you know, I've literally worked on every single episode of the show across four seasons and wow. we're starting season five, you know, coming up with that, you know, I mean, since, you know, basically I was based with production, you know, it's like I was literally at the set, film a lot of stuff at CBS studios. Um, but we also do a lot of remote filming and, you know, it was one of those things where basically, um, that production gave me carte blanche. So it's like, you know, I would get scripts in advance. I could ask location managers for, you know, access to locations. Um, I was welcome on set. You know, it's like the directors actually welcomed me being there, which was, it, it's not terribly common, I have to say. Right. Um, and it was, it was just, you know, it, it's, it's mm. a wonderful thing. You know, I mean, sadly with COVID, you know, none of that happened last season. And I don't anticipate it happening this season just because it's so much more restrictive. But, you know, it's like, you know, for three seasons, you know, it's like I was I, I was usually going out to sets at least two or three times a season in order mm. to get specific sounds. I mean, we had we had one show that we did, which had um, a race car in it. You know, it's like a, this, these NASCAR, you know, very yeah. fast, you know, track cars. And, you know, it's like actually in that instance, which was very fascinating, was that the, the director on that particular episode was actually one of the picture editors I worked with. So he made a special request. You know, it's like you have to come out to the raceway to get the sound of this car mm -hmm. as it yeah. really sounds, because, you know, I don't think we're going to be able to make that happen with, you know, other recordings. So, you know, again, it's one of those things where, you know, it's like when the production is really supportive of your involvement in that kind of a capacity, it makes things great. Yeah. Um, you know, with Flags of Our Fathers, uh, you know, Alan Murray supervised that show. Uh, and if Flags of Our Fathers and Letters from Iwo Jima really almost need to be considered a singular entity as far as the production yeah, yeah. of them go. Oh, yeah. Mm. Um, but like for Flags of Our Fathers, we were um, we went out to uh, U.S. Marine Corps base in 29 Palms with the first tank division four different occasions to record artillery and airstrikes and things of that sort. Yeah. Um, and then we had also done two gun shoots or three gun shoots for it, actually, now that I remember, you know, where we actually had all of the weapons that were used in the production and we did new recordings for them. Oh, cool. Um, and then we did, you know, we, we even did, you know, a, a shoot uh, down at the Mexican border for bullet impacts and, you know, small grenade explosions where we were using, you, it, you'll probably very much appreciate this. Um, it was determined that we should use a, 1800s era gatling gun for our projectiles so oh we, wow so what 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 drove that decision for that yeah i mean the, the mass of the rounds uh may seem to make sense um okay. and also it, it you know so you get that that sort of sound when it when it hits oh very much so yeah i mean you know we were able to put you know microphones down in our impact area and hit various surfaces and stuff i suppose that that raises questions about when you're given a list of weapons and you have uh -huh. something like a, like an m16 or 
something else. Obviously, they all sound distinctly different in reality. Mm -hmm. And so you have to recreate that on film. I imagine it's kind of a, a challenge to get those sounds to sound how people expect them to sound mm -hmm. and also differentiate them. That's probably the biggest thing. It's not so much getting, you know, an M16 to sound correct. It's a mm -hmm. matter of having five guys with M16s all shooting at the same time and you having a sense of delineation between the characters. So it, so it doesn't sound like the same, you know, gun being used all the time. Totally. That makes, yeah, that makes complete yeah. sense. Even I though can't... it is, it's not. It's, yeah, that's really interesting. Well, it's fascinating because, I mean, you know, as, as I mentioned, I do a lot of, of weapons recording for video games and, you know, other you know, films I'm not involved with editorially. And, um, you know, it's like I found personally that, you know, it's like I, I do my sequencing of weapons, whatever, you know, weapons they, they wish to record, you know, I usually build by caliber. So it's like, you know, I'll put all of my 5.56 caliber guns in series. So essentially it's like, yeah, the microphone settings and recorder settings are not going to be significantly different because it's the same cartridge being fired. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, the loudness is going to be pretty similar. Um, and, you know, any differences in, in you know, the, the sound of the gun. You know, if you have, a, you know, an, uh, an M4 carbine or a HK416, which is what we use on SEAL Team, yeah. Um, or, you know, compared to, you know, other 5.56 guns like a HK-53 or um, something like a Tavor, you know, mm -hmm. carbine, uh, yeah. you know, or, or a Steyr AUG. You know, I mean, those are all going to have somewhat different sounds, even the G36. HK. Well, yeah, firearms all have different sort of, even when, they are, even when it isn't the actual sound of the gunshot, it's the resonance of the barrel and that right. kind of thing. Well, in the action, if, if you've you know. got a close-up shot of someone, you're going to have that sort of resonance right. within within that shot, aren't you? Uh, definitely. And you know, I mean, the thing the thing that I, I should probably say first and foremost in in film and TV. You no, know, I mean this is not for documentary, but for dramatic film and TV. Usually, in most cases, the accuracy isn't nearly as important. I mean, I think that yeah. we've kind of we've kind of moved towards it more in recent days or recent times mm. but before it was like you know you, you really had a sense of uh, the, the the a weapon sound from a firearm matching the the character that was firing it so right. if, you know you had your you had your quote-unquote hero gun you know which would be you know the indiana jones pistol or uh dirty harry's pistol you know where yeah, it's like of it sounded nothing like what you knew that gun really sounded like you know, it was, it was literally like, you know, the end of the world. I think, you know, Gary Rydstrom did a wonderful breakdown of the, um, the, the Schwarzenegger shotgun in Terminator 2. You know, where it's like, you know, there were so many elements that were far beyond what would be sensible in a realistic portrayal of that particular gun. But the, the, the dramatic moment required it to be bigger than that. You know, I mean, it's like you really can't get away with you know, realistic sounds. Well, actually, I shouldn't say you can't get, you can get away with realistic sounds, but it really depends on how the movie is constructed. What would you say was the most like common misheard gun then? In my opinion, if there was ever a gun that was consistently misrepresented on screen, it would be the Thompson submachine gun. Charles was kind enough to send us some clips, so I'll play it for us now, um, and then Char Charles can explain. There we are. That was the Saving Private Ryan Thompson. Which I consider to be the ultimate Thompson recording. Earlier in, in preparation for this, um, I actually got a chance to speak with Gary Rydstrom, who was the sound designer and re-recording mixer on Private Ryan. And, and I mean, Gary is, for one, probably one of the nicest people to have ever had any involvement with Hollywood that at least I've certainly come across. I mean, mm -hmm. I am a gigantic fan of his um you know as i mentioned terminator 2 greatly influenced me wanting to get into the industry to begin with and the fact that he is such an incredibly generous and wonderful person and he did that track just you know it, it, it it's a, it's a wonderful extension of awesomeness in my opinion but the thing that's interesting about the, that particular gun which that recording uh, uh, in gary's record or remembrance of it 
um, you know, they had recorded a bunch of sounds of the weapons for Private Ryan specifically, but he believed that that was a recording that Ben Burt did, uh, probably for Raiders of the Lost Ark on the Skywalker Ranch property. That's interesting because we recently um, we we recently covered when Trumpets Fade, the HBO uh, production from the same year as Private Ryan. Rob noticed that some of the some of that Thompson sound does also sort of appear in the background of that, didn't you, Rob? Mm-hmm. It was like it was faded out, but you could definitely tell it was the same bursts. You know, mm. we, we played it a uh-huh. few times. It was just really interesting to to hear it, and now hearing that it was not filmed for Saving Private Ryan, it's, like, it's mind blowing. It really is. Oh yeah, well I think I mean I want to say the Indiana Jones I I think came out in the early '80s. Yeah, but you know it, it's an older recording, and the thing that is particularly interesting about it, and you know something that you guys might have noted, you know, in in the more recent you know military films, is that the guns have a certain crispness to them, you know, and and, and a certain metallic quality to them mm. that I think you know I would ascribe to being a part of you know digital recording being used to capture them in the field. Um, you know, that Thompson that we just played was recorded to an analog Nagra. So that was, you know, basically using 1960s, 1970s film sound technology. And, you know, Ben just got an amazing recording. You know, if it is Ben's recording, which I have every confidence that it probably is. Um, <clears throat> but it just has has this extremely pleasing and powerful sound to it. Yeah, you know, it's like you listen to it and you go, "Yeah, that that's a gun that is meaning business." The section where they're around at the bunker and, and mm-hmm. Miller Tanks is like covering fire, and he and he exactly. leans around the corner and he gives a whole mag, and you right. see the thuds hitting into that emplacement where they're trying to take it out. It, mm-hmm. it might as well be like a, a fully automatic cannon that he's firing. It just exactly. It has so much punch to it and it's like video games as well if you feel the weapon that is on screen that you're using or you're seeing on screen if you feel like that's powerful it it adds something to your the pleasure of viewing the movie oh absolutely a, a viscerally pleasing experience that scene in particular you know it's very clear that it's that recording and then also the scene when they're ambushing the, the half track, when they actually meet Matt Damon's character, you know, Tom Hanks's Thompson has the same sound. Mm. And the thing that's weird, it, it, and it was, it was a minor distraction for me, was that those locations would have had dramatically different acoustics, and yet the gun sounds kind of similar. So it's like... Uh, totally, yeah. That, that's Never the only that thing that, that, that I would think, you know, and, you know, I'm a sound geek. So it's like, you know, I'm, I'm as geeky as I guess for that. Even with that caveat, it's still the most satisfying Thompson submachine gun sound I've ever heard in my life. I think you're right. The, the, the typical societal war was, you know, it's like Thompson submachine gun really came into prominence in the, the roaring 20s, the gang wars here in the United States. And it was called the Chicago typewriter. Yeah. And the reason why is it, it, it is a very clacky sounding gun. You know, mm. it's firing a pistol caliber round. You know, it, it, you hear a lot of mechanism in it. And it's, you know, it sounds like a sewing machine, you know, more than, you know, a gun. And as you were mentioning, you know, as far as, you know, that scene in Ryan on Omaha, um, you know, it's like, here's a guy with a Thompson submachine gun shooting at a guy with an MG42. And it's like the outrageousness of the, you know, imbalance <laughs> of power there yeah. is actually pretty breathtaking. You know, it's like, you know, MG42 shooting a full power rifle cartridge at 1,200 rounds per minute could make Swiss cheese out of all those guys. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, it, 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 essentially the Germans only have to worry about an actual lucky shot getting to them mm. as opposed to them being able to lay directed fire very specifically in a large copious volume. Mm. onto our heroes but you know it's like they are heroes so it's like it's an appropriate hero gun in yeah. my opinion i think in that sequence ryben like uses his bar as well and that's definitely you know that whole that initial sequence where they're all taking their first shots at actual enemy troops right. it feels it's like the you know that's their first action in, in the war and like it that mm-hmm. we see so it has to be this cacophony of sound because firearms are the extension of the men in, in oh that. sure it's just amazing how sound can have that effect. I think it's just something that we've not thought of 
as much as we should do when we watch these films because we're not conscious maybe of it. Yeah, right. that's true. That's true. I think sound design and, and also, I mean, we, we often talk about on this podcast, um, we often talk about cinematography, mm-hmm. but we don't probably don't talk enough about uh, other aspects like sound design and, and editing and that side. Mm. But one thing that strikes me from the Saving Private Ryan scene, because there's so much going on in, in that, that scene, and you would have had it with um, Iwo Jima and Flags of Our Fathers, mm-hmm. you know, those beach assaults where there's so much going on in the ba- any battle scene that you've you've probably worked on from, sure. from Starship Troopers onwards. You've got so much going on. How do you sort of frame that within your mind of, of trying to get everything to, to sort of sound realistic and obviously you have distance between things that are going on. So in the background, you've got things that are quieter because right. they're further away and that kind of thing. So you're, you're obviously having to think about the sound in, in like a 3D space. That must be a huge challenge. So how, how do you sort of like frame that and, and try and piece that sort of thing together? Um, you know, I, I think, you know, one way to look at it is sort of like, um, you know, painting. You know, where it's like, you know, you, 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 you identify your foreground elements, you identify your background elements, uh, your foreground elements will tend to be your most important things. So, you know, the, one of the, the processes or I guess craft practices that we have in the way we do editorial is that we, we group material that is, has a specific importance or a specific type of material all so that it can be controlled Across the board with one fader or you know so that like you could bring up your background battle as you see fit and you could mm. reduce it as you see, saw a need for it actually i should i should i should roll back a tiny bit into what i would say is kind of the overarching organization of sound in in film and television productions uh which is you know you have dialogue which is always going to be your most important thing unless you're a christopher Nolan. one <laughs> um, yeah. uh, and then you have your sound effects and then you have your music mm-hmm. and you know in in most cases you're going to basically see you know dialogue's going to be the most important function or have the most inf- important role in a given moment followed by music followed by sound effects or sound you know other sound if you will and sound effects would be would be essentially divided in foreground and background sound so you know essentially um you know, we, we had a, a, a particular aesthetic called hyperrealism, which kind of came out of Jim Cameron and, you know, the, right. a, a, you know, uh, Aliens, uh, Abyss, Terminator. He basically focuses very much on the foreground. So it's like, you know, the foreground will be in dramatic relief from what's happening in the background. Um, in, in Private Ryan, you know, it's like, it's very clear that there is a lot of space between what's happening in the foreground and the background. You know, it's not right. all, all bunched up. I mean, it would probably be a bloody cacophony. You know, it'd be like going out, you know, yeah. onto a free uh, a, a freeway or an expressway. You know, in in high traffic. Yeah. And you you know how loud that is. It's it's phenomenally loud. You know, it's like the the sounds that are close to you. Yes, they're a little louder, but it's like it's just loud all the time. So you don't have kind of a creative distinction. So you've got to create. You've got to create the, the the feeling of that, but also make it intelligible for the viewer's brain. It, it, going back to the the whole idea of you know the the sound designer, you know, being you know akin to the sonic version of the director of photography. Mm-hmm. What you're doing essentially is building in or, oral relief in the same manner that you know you would have compositional relief in the image. You know, so it's like you know we're we're trying to essentially make a three D landscape that has depth where you know, we have, you know, powerful sounds that could be happening at a distance. Um, and then we have our immediate sounds, which have to have however much veracity is required for, you know, what's on screen and the reactions of the characters. Um, and, you know, a lot of times, you know, you'll see, you know, all sorts of different sounds that are entirely unrelated being used in order to provide an emotional backstopping to that as well. Right. Um, I'm sure you've heard screams and explosions and things like that. I mean... I, th- I personally believe that, you know, um, the horror of war is always based in the human voice, you know, essentially, or, or animal voices, or, you know, essentially the reaction to the violence being physically, you know, absorbed by the victim. 
all the explosions, guns, jets, tanks, all that stuff, you know, I mean, basically delivers, it, it leads up to delivering that effect. Now, you know, you can, you can take this into a political conversation and say, you know, it's like if I want to politically promote warfare or, you know, like nationalism or whatever, you're going to overemphasize the mechanical side of it and underemphasize the human, you know, yep. the human consequences of it. Because essentially nobody likes to think they're Hitler or, you know, it's like, you know, nobody wants to believe that they're, they're the bad guy. You know, they're, they're just, they're just working to the, to, to the final victory. Um, and, you know, that's, that's something that, you know, each filmmaker is going to have a very specific idea about how they want to portray. I guess that all factors into essentially, you know, how you make these choices, you know, in the way I, I tend to work when I did Flags of Our Fathers of the Pacific, you know, I would always, you know, essentially make the sounds of a particular gun for a particular individual through a whole scene. Wow. So like, you know, if Sledge, you know, had a particular gun that he was using, you know, I think he carried an M1 carbine in the Pacific most of the time. I think so. I would, I would basically make sure that his gun was consistent, you know, using the same sounds and, you know, it, that it matched, you know, the energy of what he was doing. And then say, you know, going to someone else, you know, jumping over to, you know, John Bazelon, you know, with his guns, you know, or, you know, Robert Lecky or you know, any of the others, you know, flags of our fathers was the same thing. You know, it's like you, you basically, you have your principal characters. They have to have, you know, a, a sound that is satisfying, which conveys their position in the story. And then you, you essentially have all of the exceptions. You know, it's like, I think when, um, when sledge, for instance, was at the bunker, when the Japanese soldier ran at him after the flamethrower attack, when he shot him, he, it was a much bigger sound. Um, I think, you know, going back to the, the Omaha Beach moment uh, we were talking about earlier, you know, with the, the Thompson and the BAR and the, 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 the rifles, you know, if you look at, um, you know, the sound of the M1 Garands, which were used by, you know, like Vin Diesel and um, Malik, you yeah. know, they're, they're shooting their rifles and they're actually very small sounding compared to the Thompson, which would be entirely insane. They're 30 out six, the full rifle yeah. caliber. Yeah, exactly. So they're very small, but then when uh, the sniper, uh, well, Barry Pepper, yeah, Barry Pepper's character, you know, shoots the German machine gunner with his rifle, the, the 1903, it's you know, it, it's it's a hero moment. Yeah, yeah, his, yeah, the rifle caliber that he's using is the same it's as exactly those the Garands, same, but it doesn't sound the know? same as the Garands, yeah, right, because of, of the dramatic you know requirement of of that moment. It's like you know, a barret like going off, doesn't he? When he when he takes some of them out, it's so loud, you know. But it's really it's satisfying, isn't it, for the viewer? You want oh, yeah. you want that punch, don't you? Because he's the sniper, you know. It's his. You want to feel like he's as accurate as mm. he looks, almost. Right. Well, I think, and you know, I think that that's one of the things about you know Pepper's gun throughout the film. It's like any time you see his gun through a scope, it's going to be essentially like God reaching down and bringing destruction. Hmm. You know, mm. it's it's extremely precise. He never misses, except when he's in the tower, because he actually yeah. misses a number of times when he's shooting down at the Germans with the assault weapon or assault gun. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, his gun is always very satisfying sounding. Strangely enough, the Garands throughout never really have a huge amount of oomph to them. You they know, don't really I mean, have a hero moment, though, do they, I suppose? Not really. And when... Uh, the, the the typist shoots the that's German. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that, 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 that's kind of a hero moment with the Grand. Yeah, you know, and that was you know that, that obviously you, you, that had to happen that way. So yeah. I mean, it wasn't like you know it wasn't like they broke canon, but it's just yeah. a matter of like okay, you have you know you you have essentially an aesthetic that you go for, but then you have you know certain exceptions which are to be expected, and then so, you essentially match it up. How do you make how would you make a hero gun bigger? So when you've when you have a Thompson, obviously it's re in reality it's more of a clack than a, mm -hmm. a, a satisfying boom. But when you need to to bring that you know big sound, are there ways? Do you layer different sounds on top of one another to make it sound like a like a um, I don't know a more dense sound, or is it literally volume or? Are there different ways of approaching that in making the sound effect bigger? Well, it tends to be your first, you know, uh, first observation, which is layering. 
Right. Um, I mean, we had a more a interesting scene. answer then, basically. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, which I, I mean, honestly, it's like in most cases, we're going to have layers on the guns to begin mm-hmm. with, um, you know, even for secondary characters. Um, you know, a good example, you know, which I think you guys would like is that um, we had a scene in Flags of Our Fathers when essentially on the beach assault, we have one guy who we don't really know who he is, but he goes in the back of a Japanese bunker with the Thompson and will you know, lets it rip. And I was trying to get something kind of similar to the Ben Burt recording in the quality of it. And we had recorded, you know, Thompson's for that film, um, which were good sounding. You know, I mean, they had a good quality to them. But I ended up essentially layering and, and essentially precisely matching the firing rate of the Thompson with a Bren gun. So, you know, okay. it's a 303 Bren oh, wow. that I would recorded actually for a video game. And it gave me the kind of density of sound that i was looking for um you know it, it was much more satisfying to me because you know if, if you have like some little clackety thing it's like oh yeah i'm sure that they're going to be really impressed by that you yeah know, again, like, again it comes back to that sort of viewer expectation element to it doesn't it where mm-hmm. people expect guns to sound a certain way oh, uh, and 90 percent of people that watch movies have never been in the presence of an actual gun where it's been fired so right. They have right. an expectation that's been built yeah. up over the years through watching TV and movies and, and that sort of thing anyway. Oh, sure. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's and, you know, it's like then you have all the subconscious stuff as well. You know, I mean, mm. you know, it's like, I mean, I grew up watching black and white, you know, kinescope versions of The Untouchables, you know, but with Robert Stack. And the guns all sounded really cool. I mean, the Thompsons, they sounded much more similar to Ben Burt's recording than what we are accustomed to hearing nowadays. Um, and it was just, really due to the, you know, if you, if you will, it, it was due to the limitations technically that, that were a part of that time. Um, but you know, the end, the end result was in my opinion, something that was more dramatically satisfying. Yeah. Um, I, Cause I really appreciate the, I think there's a, a little sequence in a uh, film, full metal jacket where one of the characters is firing his M16 in the, in the way battle. And it sounds really metallic. And I'm mm-hmm. having fired M16A1s so to reenact the Vietnam War. Um, sure. Having used an M16A1 blank firer, and you hear that, it's almost like a paintball gun going off. And then to hear exactly. it in Full Metal Jacket, I just appreciate the, the, that at least that one is sounding more realistic to me. And, yeah. I, and I just, I appreciate that on a sort of, on a, like a geeky level. I'm like, oh, right. good. You know, Kubrick sound designer really nailed that one. You know, it's not oh, like sure. a big boom. I kind of appreciate that. Yeah, it, it, actually, if you if you want something that is probably a fun bit of trivia, the re-recording sound mixer on Full Metal Jacket was Andy Nelson, and he was also the dialogue re-recording mixer on Saving Private Ryan. Oh wow! Ah. So great. That's great. So that's kind of a fun little bit. I mean, it's it's it, it, the M sixteen A one is a particularly you know amusing thing to talk about because. If you've shot one with a full plastic stock, you know, it, it is a very comical sound. You know, you have this mm-hmm. twang and, you know, it sounds like there's somebody with a, a slinky, you know, or somebody put a slinky inside the gun. <laughs> so it's like, you know, the Star Wars or the um, uh, Star Trek, you know, photon torpedo sound, you know, where it's just like, oh, you know, it's like they can't really be serious about this, you know, because this does not. I mean, if I was taking this into battle and having to actually shoot at people, I would, I, I, I would feel weird about it. You know. Yeah. Which... Well, I mean, whenever anyone talks about the whole toy aspect of the M16, they always, people that have never shot one, always think more about you know the plasticiness of it. Right. Which is right. an element, obviously, because you can hear the buffer spring and you know oh, the resonance exactly, of, the, yeah. of the bolt carrier inside it, and it does resonate. But yeah, the, I think when people mostly hear that said, they always think, "Oh yeah, it's light and it's plastic." Right. Whereas, but you know, whereas the guys that are shooting them in Vietnam were thinking, "Oh, this is very different to my M14." Which oh is, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it is funny. I mean, it's just I I really just I like the metallic sound of an M16 A1 anyway. I just think it, it's it's satisfying to me. So I just, well, I, the, just I mean, like the, the AR platform is a very good sounding gun. I mean, it's it, you know for the most part. You know, it has defined the modern firearm as far as, you know, military usage and police mm. usage, you know, much in the way that, you know, like something like an MP5, you know, is considered to be kind of a universal submachine gun, you know, yeah. even though, you know, it, it's really, you know, 1960s, 70s technology, 
Mm. I just don't think that they've really, you know, anybody has come out with something that has been more compelling and more kind of universal in its appeal. Yeah, visually and, and acoustically, I, I think you're right there. What I wanted to caveat off um, was your observation about the the original Untouchables oh. and a little question about how has sound effects of, I suppose, let's be more specific, sort of battle and firearms and explosion sound effects, to my untrained ear, mm-hmm. I can sort of date sort of periods of sound effects a little bit. Sure. So, you, you know, sure. with original um, Westerns and war movies from the 40s, 50s, mm-hmm. into the 60s, you have those characteristic ricochets and, and that. Oh, yeah. You know, those sort of firearm sounds that were used frequently and you can always pick them out. Sure. And then it sort of changes. And obviously in the 90s, there was, there was a sea change with Private Ryan and, and a new generation of sound designers, et cetera, that were bringing like a bigger sound, different sounds. So would you say it's, that's something that you can do, that you can sort of, you, there's been periods of change and you can sort of pick them out? In films now, you don't really hear ricochet sounds as much as you did in like the 50s, 60s. Uh, within okay. the, the, the sort of soundscape of you know, action sequences. Um, well, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, it, it, for the work I've done, you know, it's like I, I focus directly on bullet impacts because it's like I, I like essentially the consequence side of the conflict. Um, mm-hmm. So whenever I have an opportunity to make a bullet impact, not necessarily a ricochet, but just, you know, the bullet impacting or going past, you know, it's like I'll, I'll try to jump on those things personally. Um you know, other people might not be as inclined and other people are even more inclined than I am. It's very interesting. You know, if, if we look back on uh, the documentary footage that came out of World War II. In fact, actually, I was just watching a uh, Marine Corps documentary that was from the war about the Battle of Tarawa. Oh, Marines yesterday. at Tarawa. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, you know, you listen to the, to the sound there. And for the most part, those are, you know, actual battle sounds you know i mean that's that's the sound of the battle it's not necessarily sync sound from the shot that you're seeing but you know it is it is consistent and i know um in the bbc sound library they have a number of world war ii actuality recordings which were done from uh i think the the campaign in holland in the netherlands and uh oh, I know those. yeah there's some of those on the iwm website as well yeah they yeah. would have been captured on uh, midget recorders and, you know, and some of those recordings, I think, were used... Actually, I know that some of the BBC recordings were used in Private Ryan. Oh, wow. That's really interesting. Yeah, if you, if you go to the BBC library specifically and find the Tiger Tank, it, it is used uh, by Gary before we see the Tigers arrive. So oh, it's that rumble in the distance. distance. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, which, I mean, like I said, I was, you know, I, I was a huge, you know, well, being a huge Gary Ridesman fan, it's like I love Pr- Private Ryan to me. You know, actually, it's kind of interesting. You know, a lot of people will say that Private Ryan redefined the war movie um, as far as sonically. I would say that a more accurate appraisal of that would be Forrest Gump. The Vietnam, mm-hmm. the Vietnam ambush in Forrest Gump, I feel, was the first time we saw the kind of aesthetic that private ryan emerged from and and that's not obviously you know it's like i'll be the last person to diminish any of gary's achievements uh, because i like i said i think he 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 has a brilliance that is extraordinary um but you know it, that was the first time we kind of had again that sonic aesthetic presented to us i don't think we had really seen anything quite like that prior to that um you know, I mean, through the 70s, you know, war movies were, relatively speaking, fairly realistic sounding. You know, they didn't really go over the top so much. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, then, you know, then we had like, you know, uh, Rambo, you know, or, you know, like the, the, the Chuck Norris Delta Force f- films and yeah, stuff where yeah. it, it all became a little bit, you know, kind of hyper comical almost, mm-hmm. you know, where it's like, you know, everything was giant compared to, you know, other stuff. Um, and I, I, I think I did send some examples over, you know, like the, the, the Fox ricochets, you know, which is like, the, yeah. the, it's a very distinct, um, machine gun set of rico- ricochets, which, you know, will be instantly identifiable to any war fan. Yeah. I'll play some of this for us, those for us now. I 
I would consider that to be kind of the stereotypical ricochet sound. Mm-hmm. And to be honest, that does pop up in Band of Brothers. Oh wow! <laughs> in, in I think I, I'm trying to think what episode it was. I think it, it might have been Carrington. Yeah, that, um, yeah, yeah. That and and it was sense, just like it? you know, considering how I, I mean, the Band of Band of Brothers was really amazing. Cam- Campbell Askew did an incredible job editorially. They they recorded all the vehicles. They had like you know they had excellent access to production, and it showed in the general track when those Ricos, you know showed up in that episode it was almost like having a wilhelm scream you know where it's maybe like, you know, maybe it was a nod yeah that's that's a good point it, it's 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 it is possible but it was one of those things where it's like okay you know it's like this is a, this is not a place where i would do something like that personally i would feel mm-hmm. really really self-conscious about it because you know band of brothers you know basically saving private ryan band of brothers the pacific you know, it's like, you know, that whole, you know, Flags of Our Fathers, Letters from Neo Jima, they're very serious movies. Mm. And it's like, you know, yeah. they're, they're supposed to be very reflective. And when you throw in a comic element, to me, that's kind of really, you know, it, it actually, there was, there was a great thing that I observed in, in Saving Private Ryan. But in the final battle of Ramel, uh, you have that moment when um, Tom Sizemore's character, uh, shoots the bazooka at the German assault gun in the back of it, and it blows up. And I told him, it's like, yeah, I, you know, I don't know why, but it's like whenever I play that, it sounds like there's chickens clucking <laughs> after the explosion. You know, like it's some kind of Warner Brothers gag. Right. And he said, oh, no, 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 I can assure you. There, there was, you know, it's like there might, you know, obviously, you know, he he puts design elements in to, you know, kind of sell the emotion of it. But he said Steven was like constant. Steven Spielberg was constantly saying, "Don't don't put any of your sound designer tricks in this thing." So like, I don't want any of that stuff. I want it to be legit. I want it to be real. I don't want to make fun of people. And and Gary was saying, "Yeah, it's like you know." So no, you know, we we didn't put anything in there intentionally. If it ended up being a sound that gave that impression, it was not something that we were shooting for. We have to go and watch that again now i think that's really Which is very fascinating you know i mean and and you know as I, said, I mean gary like i said being literally you know the most perfect sound designer i've ever had the mm. pleasure of being able to be exposed to you know it's like he he is really really serious about making his directors happy so he wouldn't yep. do something you know that would be an inside joke you know it's like so how how often does that actually happen then it's kind of a mixed bag Right. I mean, I think that context has a lot to do with it. Um, you know, the Wilhelm scream has certainly gotten a huge amount of mileage. Yeah, it's um, basically you know become I mean? a meme at this point, hasn't it? It, it? Yeah, I mean, you know, Ben Burt used it as his meme, you know, for, you know, a lot of his output. And he was doing it with kind of a fun but respectful nod to essentially, you know, the the, the industry. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. it's like that was, that was his thing. You know, people kind of ran with it and i have to say that i i even used it a few times ironically um you know uh i put it in the film fantastic four i I think we got like three of them in but it was one of those things (laughs) where it's like well in that film you know it's like in inside of the actual production process it hit this point of being so so surreal and out of balance that we were essentially doing it as kind of a passive aggressive expression Right. And, and and we were just like trying to trying to see if they'd get past, you know, the people who were the decision makers. Right. And they did. And it was like, oh, God, it's like, you know, this makes it even more depressing. You know, just, you know they don't even <laughs> care. So, yeah. So, I, I, mean, I don't think I'd heard one for, for a while. And then I um, when I watched Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, I think there's one in the first 10 minutes where it's the Bounty Law um, right. fake trailer. And the guy gets taken out by DiCaprio and he falls off the like the, the the house he's on and it, and it is a Wilhelm scream and it I was right. like, I haven't heard one then in years you know I think, I think I, this is a good point to play the Wilhelm scream yes I think I should a man getting bit by an alligator and he screams
I like being able to hear the little directions that are being given in that. Well, I was going to say, I have to confess, I don't think I've ever noticed them before. You're listening to it right now. Yeah, I, 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 hmm. I, he's, he's literally saying, no, really go for it. <laughs> it's like, yeah. There's some of them in there that, that you pick up in other films. So I think people have obviously taken that that reel and, and gone, oh, well, actually, I'll, I won't use the, the, the Wilhelm scream. I'll use right. a Wilhelm scream. Yeah, from, from there's one right. in, I think, isn't there one in Titanic? Yeah, well, in, in Titanic, oh, sure. he jumps off the, the, the boat and hits. Is it when we, I, one of them, yeah. Yeah, it's right. funny the films you remember it in more than the actual sound effect. I think I think it's odd. Everyone's got their own like where well, they I'm remember. I'm sure there's it. a blog out there that covers it completely. There's probably even a podcast. Well, <laughs> there, there is actually a there, there's a YouTube video that has quite a number of them strung back and back, back to oh, back. Oh yeah, yeah. Which is great. You know, it's like in Batman. It's in Toy Story. Uh, oh, you yeah, know, obviously, yeah, you know, Ben stuff. You know, it's very funny. You know, and it has you know leads off with the original. Uh, Charge it feather weather, charge it feather river, uh, usage of it. Which, was that what it's know, from? Oh wow, I never knew that, that. I think that was the the or, yeah, I think I th- that sounds right to me. I think that's yeah, yeah. yeah. Steve Steve Lee is like the curator of the Wilhelm scream. Okay, um, you probably know better, but I believe that the original source recording that we listened to was recorded for the film Distant Drums, right? And then it was used. It, 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 where it got the Wilhelm title was Trooper in Wilhelm? Charge, it, Charge It Feather River, where Willem is, you know, sitting on his horse and he gets, you know, you hear an off screen command, you know, come on, Wilhelm. And he says, I'll be there. Just let me fill my pipe. And then you they cut away to a, an Indian fighter shooting the arrow into his leg. And then he does the scream right okay so that's that's how it as far as i understand it that's how it became the wilhelm scream you know versus you know the, the because again it's my it's my understanding that the person who actually performed the scream was this guy sheb woolley who um it was a character actor i guess in hollywood most people would know him from this weird song i think from the 60s called um flying purple people eater and obviously, you know, it's, it's echoed past. I mean, you know, we, we do stuff like that, you know, more than you would think. I had one film, which I'm not going to name, um, that I worked on that, you know, we had a character where whenever she sat down, I put a, a fart noise. <laughs> you know, just, you know, and it's like it never, you know, played significantly. But it was like, you know, if she sat in, you know, sat down on a leather chair, you'd hear, you know, mm-hmm. a bit of a leather movement, but there'd be a, a <laughs> fart inside it. And um, I know, like, we, when we were working on the Alamo, the, the Disney one, there's a scene where, you know, the, 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 the Texans are storming the barricades of, the, of Senna's army. And there's a guy in, like, um, you know, a, a, a leather, you know, leather outfit, like a Daniel Boone outfit who does a flying right. leap across the barricade. And I tried to get a Wilhelm in there, and um, it, it got caught. So um, I don't know if you, you're in the UK, so I don't know if you'd really remember this at all. But in, um, I think it was the 19 or the 2000 election here for president. Uh, right. it, it was uh, George George H or George W. Bush beating Al Gore in the primary. Up to that, um, there was this guy Howard Dean who was like a I think he was like the government of one of, you know, Vermont or something. And he he had this weird meltdown at a primary after he lost, where he did this like kind of Wilhelm esque scream. So I actually found that and I put that in, and it made it in, and it was pretty <laughs> funny. So when you when you watch it, it's like that's Howard Dean, the politician, screaming as the guy flies across the barricade. <laughs> that was kind amazing. of fantastic. That's so, really interesting. It's amazing, like how something like the Wilhelm scream, which was supposed to be a guy getting eaten by a crocodile. Because cool. Distant Drum is set in Florida, I think during the Seminole War, and there is, I think there is a scene where someone gets eaten by a crocodile. So obviously it was recorded for that, right. and yet it's it's gone from that original purpose through to everything from Star Wars to, you know, it's like transcended the yeah yeah it's really fascinating. I mean, I think that the one the the burning question for me is. What's your favourite war film that you've worked on, Charles? 
The favorite war film I have done. If for a single film, I mean, probably one that was the most influential for, you know, where I ended up today mm -hmm. was uh, a movie that we were doing actually kind of in concert with um, the Alamo. It's called The Great Raid. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. With James Franco and... Yeah. yeah about the Cabanatuan uh, rescue. Um, you know, basically a lot of stuff that, you know, became really important to me was seeded from that experience. Mm. And you know, the thing that was interesting, I mean, the Alamo as well. I mean, you know, the thing that was fascinating for me was that, you know, we basically were working on both those films at the same time. So it's like, you know, we would be working, you know, a few months on Alamo and then it would go away and Great Raid would be there. And we'd be working on Great Raid. And we basically right. tag team over the course of about a year. I really like both of those films. I, I like, I really enjoyed the, the, the Alamo retelling. Yeah, um, no, I mean, I think it's, Great I think Raid's it's a, a really good. interesting movie. On I really like the Great Raid. It's underrated, yeah. I think. It's really underrated. Yeah, yeah I mean, and it, well, the, the thing that was funny was that was basically, that was during that election cycle. 2004, were they out? That was 2004, I believe. Yeah. Um, and it was one of those things where basically, well, I, I mean, I don't know if this is absolute truth, but it's, it's, it's apocryphally told. Miramax was very... Um, very much anti-supporting Bush. And they right. saw that essentially as a patriotic film. So it was the decision of the Miramax leadership to not promote it because wow, they didn't okay. want to essentially give political advantage to the conservatives. Um, Alamo or Great Raid? Oh, that was on the Great Raid. Great Raid, okay. Al Alamo, sense, yeah. I, I'm not sure why Alamo, Alamo failed, aside from its kind of darker depiction mm. of an American iconic story. I mean, I remember um, the raid getting quite a bit of pre like press over here. I, I, that's mm. so I rented it because I saw it in like magazines, like paper paper adverts and things. I, sure. I went and got it off of that. So it's it's weird to hear that you know it didn't get the publicity that it deserved in America. That's really interesting. Yeah, it was very strange. I mean, you know, and, mm. and you know, I mean, they it, it, the thing that always you know made us crazy was you know like. It, in the beginning of the film, you know, they clearly say this is based on real events. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like there's some, you know, some dramatic license has been taken. But, it, you know, it was based on real events. And, you know, we went to test screenings where, you know, people would say, did that really happen? You know, it's like they, it's like, yes, you know, we said that on the front. And, you know, it's like they, they couldn't believe it. They, they couldn't believe that it was a real event. And it's like, well, okay, you know, I mean, I don't know what to tell you on that. Um, but I know, you know, we actually got, uh, a letter from the department of defense here, you know, congratulating, or it wasn't us doing sound, but you know, the, the John Dahl, the, the film, yeah, the production, yeah. Um, you know, got a letter thanking them for essentially, you know, a, a very accurate portrayal of that particular mission, which is considered to be one of the most successful, you know, um, special forces missions ever. Yeah. It's really interesting. You know? You know, it's, yeah. it's a film that's on the list for, t uh, for us to cover, that's for sure. I know that much. I mean, Alamo is too, actually. Yeah, they all are. I mean, we, <laughs> the list is ever-growing. I've learned so much, and uh, your career is incredible. So if anyone hasn't seen any... any look up Charles on IMDb, and, and you'll just, <laughs> you can go through his credits with a tooth comb, and there'll be something something for everyone in there. You know, gaming fans... You know, I know, we've only touched on the war movies. I exactly. Mean. <laughs> I mean, it's just incredible. And, you know, I really want to thank Charles for coming on the show today. It's been a bit of a long time coming, getting him on and talking to him today. But we're really grateful. Uh, um, just hearing your, your, about your work is just so so fantastic and amazing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, great. Well, what's a pleasure. So, thank you. And obviously, um, as always, you can follow the pod on Twitter at Fighting on Film. We're on Facebook, uh, Fighting on Film. Uh, search that on Facebook, you'll find us. We're on Patreon as well, if you feel inclined to support us. And leave a like, share, a review on whatever you're listening on, and we'll catch you again in the next one. So, Charles, thank you so much. Thanks so much for joining us, Charles. Very good. Thanks. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks for listening, everyone. <laughs>